Thanks everyone for being here with us today for this in-person educational program of the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents and three distinguished guests that we are honored to have them with us here today. I would like to start by introducing uh, each one of our special guests here and then we are going to initiate our conversation and of course hopefully we will have time for questions. I know we don't have a microphone here and I would like to know, uh, this is not the microphone for speaker, but I would like to know if everybody hears us okay. Right? Great. Uh, so the number one, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Robert Sapiro. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Robert Sapiro is a professor and former chair of the Department of Political Science at Columbia University. Uh, he served as acting director uh, of Columbia's Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy during 2008 to 2009. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advanc Advancement of Science. He received a Distinguished Columbia Faculty Award in 2012 and in 2010, the Outstanding Achievement uh, Award of the New York Chapter of the American Associa Association for Public Opinion Research. He specializes in American politics with research and teaching interests in public opinion, policy making, political leadership, the mass media, uh, and applications of statistics uh, methods. Uh, he has taught at Columbia since 1982, after receiving his degree and serving as the study director of the National Opinion Research Center. Anja Sifring, thank you for being with us here. She is the director of technology, media, and communications at Columbia University's Schools of International and Public Affairs. She is a lecturer who teaches on global media, innovation, and human rights. She writes on journalism and development, investigating reporting in, a global, in the Global South, and has published extensively over the last decade on the media in Africa. Uh, more recently, she has become focused on solutions uh, to the problem on online misinformation that we hopefully will touch a little bit during our conversation, earning her PhD on the doping from the University of Navarra. Jere Van Dyke, Jere, thank you for being with us here today. You are also a very special and um, special guest and expert that you've been attending several of our events and we have the pleasure and honor to have you here as a speaker today. Uh, Jere is a journalist and author who has focused much of his writing on, on far away, most dangerous places, particularly Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, in 2006 and in 2007, he became the only journalist to go up into the mountains near Pakistani border. In late 2007, on a contract with uh, Times Books, he, he hiked into the tribal areas of Pakistan, off limits to foreigners, considered a, black sp a blank space on the map, the headquarters of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. In 2008, he was captured by the Taliban and taken up into the mountains and held there for 45 days. The uh, horrible experience is detailed in his book, Captive, My Time as a Prisoner of the Taliban, which Foreign Affairs selected as one of its must-read books for the world ahead. In 2014 and 2015, Jerev Van Dyke worked with the Obama administration at the White House and also at the National Counterterrorism Center um, on a new U.S. hostage policy. Since then, he has worked with the National Security Council, the FBI, the State Department, and families to help U.S. hostages return home. I would like to put the framework of our discussion here because each one of you has a specialization in different fields of expertise. I think that we should put down three or four words that will take us throughout the conversation. The word polarization, the word partisanship, the word misinformation, the word journalism, active journalism, and how is the role of real journalists, working journalists in this framework. And I would also add the work of the new technologies. I would like to start going through the process of unfolding each of these concepts and see how we can synthesize to draw some conclusions throughout conversation. I would like to start with Robert Sapiro to give us a little bit of an overview how polarization, which is to some extent, according to a lot of experts, results to misinformation, to division, and also how uh, partisanship plays a role uh, to that um, situation of polarized and divided society. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me and asking me a question that, that I, I've thought about for a long time and been talking about quite a lot. Now, the end result of the polarization in the United States, when we're talking about the 
United States context. We're talking about, we're talking about the United States. It works, it works, it's for the camera. Pardon? It's working? We're talking about the United States the context here. Misinformation and the whole debate, the whole, the, the ferocity and the hostility in current politics that's fraught with misinformation, disinformation, and, 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 and lies has been the result of the high level of emotions in American politics. Now, those emotions in American politics have stemmed from partisan conflict and polarization. And the one neglected part of that context is the substantive part of partisan conflict and polarization, which is based on policy issues, differences in ideology, and also the competitiveness of the parties for control of the United States government. Now, in today's politics, we have, we have, we have a Republican and a Democratic Party that are ideologically distinctive from each other. We have a Republican Party that's a genuine conservative party, a, a Democratic Party, which is a liberal party, on a wide range of issues, and even, even divided in certain ways, predictable, um, ex explicable ways on foreign policy and national security. Now, American politics wasn't always like that in the end. Well, just going back to the 20th century. Back in the 20th century, the political parties were very different. And I'll, I'll try to keep this short. This is a very long history here, and you're going to get a very short version of it. Uh, the Democratic Party was an uneasy coalition of northern liberals on economic issues and on, and on issues of justice and race and, and rights and liberties, and a conservative southern wing of the party that was conservative, racist even, on issues of civil rights and, and, and race, and also, also with regard to issues of, of labor as well. The Republican Party was a conservative party when it came to, comes to, came to economic, economics and big government, but was, was, was a socially more moderate or even liberal party. It was still, in a sense, thinking of itself as the party of Abraham Lincoln that was involved in, in the Civil War, freeing the slaves, and, and so forth. Um, to the point where political scientists in the, in the 20th century, in, 19, in 1950, the American Political Science Association put together a commission and they did a report on toward a more responsible two-party system. And one of the outcomes of the report was that, was, was that the parties ought to become more ideologically distinctive from each other so that the voters were given choices and that uh, elections could lead to turnover in which party controlled government, which could then lead to changes in policy in accord with, in accord with, with the ideology or in the policy stances of those, of those parties. What evolved after that, and, and the report had no effect on this, but what had an effect on this was the evolution of American politics. The, par the parties in the, in the 30s and 40s and early 50s were distinctive on economic welfare kinds of issues. The Democratic Party was liberal on those kinds of issues and supportive of regulation. The Republican Party was conservative on those issues. The issue of civil rights was not on the political agenda. So it, did, it, it, didn't, it, didn't, figure in, it didn't figure into any of this. Beginning in the 1960s, that, that changed. There was the whole history that led to, uh, in, in the end, with the rise of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, long story short, 1964, the, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, led by Lyndon Johnson, spurred on by the Civil Rights Movement, with, which made issues highly visible and conflictual in the United States. The, the, the Democratic Party became the party of civil rights. The Republican Party wound up, and this was the Richard Nixon Southern strategy, turned out, turned out to be the more anti-civil rights party. The Southerners that had been in the Democratic Party shifted to the, uh, the Southerners who had been in the Democratic Party shifted to the Republican Party or were replaced by lib liberal Democrats in, in, in offices. And this really makes a long story very short, but as new issues emerged, you know, back then we didn't talk about issues like the, the environment and abortion and gay rights and, 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 uh, and gun control and law and order kinds of issues, the way, the way we talk about them today. But as, as those new issues arose, the parties divided in, in, in what, what now for, to us seemed, seemed to be predictable, liberal, and conservative ways. And we, we could talk about specific issues, but I, I think you get, you get the point here. At the same time, or so, so the parties are different now. So, w so if any party controlled the presidency and Congress, they had a... Um, a more ideological 
set of goals than they had had in the past. And if they were able to get that kind of control, they could actually do things. Well, those kind of, that, that kind of control didn't happen in, in the 20th century. For most of the 20th century, the Democratic Party controlled Congress during that entire period. And this was the Democratic Party that was ideologically divided. That the Republican Party could win the presidency, but, but they never had unified Republican government. And when the Democrats had it, they, were, they, they could only do more moderate things because of the, uh, the conflict in the, between the wings of the parties. When the parties became more ideologically distinctive, what happened at the same time, and it had to do with the fact that the Republicans were able to make inroads in the South. That's, that's the big story. More, more Southern Republicans were elected to the House and to the Senate. And, and you know, getting, cl you know, af after Jimmy Carter wa was, after the Carter presidency, the Republicans became competitive not only for the presidency. Ronald, um, Ronald Reagan was, was, was elected in, in 1980, bringing with him a Republican Senate. From there on, the Republicans became competitive for the Senate. Fast forward to 1994, um, the debacle election for the Democrats in which the Republicans gained control of the House of Representatives. From that time forward, it was possible for either party to control the presidency and Congress. And, and what we saw was that that happened in the last 20 years, we've had more unified Republican-only government or Democratic-only government. And when those governments took power, they were able to do very decisive things in the, in the area of public policy. We got Obamacare, we got the changes in policies toward taxes when when Donald Trump was elected president, when Biden was elected president, a major shift to the left of, of, public, policy, of public policy. So what happened is politics became, elections became more important. With that greater importance in terms of changes in policy, politics became much more emotional, and a lot of the issues were emotional, emotionally laden. Civil issues of race, abortion, gay rights, LGBTQ, law and order, crime and punishment, capital punishment. All those issues beca th became highly emotional issues. The parties now were competing for control of government to shift the direction of public policy on all those issues. And, and by the way, control of government does, didn't just mean the House and the Senate and the presidency. It also meant control of the, of the courts, as we saw as with, the, with, the, with the ascendancy of, of a Republican Supreme Court, the result of the fact that Republicans were able to to get unified government and also with a relaxing of the rules in the Senate that allowed for judges to be confirmed in, in a way that didn't allow the other party to filibuster. So you have a situation where the stakes are more important, politics became more emotional, and with those emotions, with that level of hostility and conflict came bi perceptual biases in perceptions of reality tied to people viewing reality in a way that, comport that comported to their policy decisions. And, that, and those, dis those, misper those misperceptions of reality have kind of fostered um, misinformation, disinformation in politics. So this disinformation and misinformation in politics is underlying that is a conflict over real issues. Bob, a question. Absolutely. So you're not even talking about economics, deindustrialization, the effect of trade agreements or globalization. Well, th those have actually been th those have been new issues that have arisen, and those and on those issues the parties have been, have been split. Uh, on, um, what's what's really interesting with re respect to globalization, it's it's the Democratic Party now that's the party of glo globalization. So that's one that's one of the new issues that, that that that's arisen, and that's an issue that's that's actually hit home in terms of affecting people's everyday lives, and uh, and has actually in, in this transformation of support for the parties, w w the, there's, there's also been a demographic uh, transformation in which the part in, in which. In which, the, in, in which the Democratic Party is no longer the party of the white, w white working class. Although we define working class today as not necessarily work people in working class jobs as we, as we think about them, but, but working class has been defined as, as, as individuals without a, without a college degree. And so within this concept of who is going to take control, and there are very various issues that you just mentioned that the two parties are trying to take control. We have the element of misinformation, disinformation, which probably is used as a factor, as a vehicle, to take control on the public opinion. And there the, it comes to the next question about what is the current state? How you would, would you define misinformation with the, within the terms of journalism? And um, what do you think are the major concerns that we are facing right now? Yeah, so um, I guess 
that myths and disinformation I started to intersect with what Bob is talking about in 2016. I feel like there were, you know, the election of Trump, Brexit, the election of Modi, Duterte, Bolsonaro, all of a sudden the world sort of woke up to this problem. And I'd be, you know, I'd obviously be curious to hear Bob's um, perceptions because clearly myths and disinformation have been around forever. But all of a sudden, because of the social media platforms, it was able to go viral. And there um, is some debate about whether it's risen because of social media or to what extent local, the collapse of local news. I would say it was probably both things. But I think that 2016 was really the time that people started to think about it. And um, I didn't know if you wanted me to talk a little bit about sort of how journalists reacted. Uh, or if uh, yeah, it's too soon absolutely. To uh, but I would like, mm. would you think that, would you agree with those that in these two elements, the collapse of local news and yeah. the dissemination of the social media, would you add a third, third element, which is the mistrust towards traditional media from the public? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I feel like the literature on that is a little bit less clear, but. Clearly, high trust societies do um, seem to be less susceptible, and that would be correlated with public broadcasting. Mm -hmm. I mean, UK is a little bit of a you know outlier there, I guess, because but the BBC um, has been important. Sweden is an example because they have very high levels of public trust. Public radio is the most trusted institution there. So I think I think what I would probably say is that. The, you know, it's hard to know which sort of which came first, right? Do people trust the media because they're in high societies that are well functioning and high trusting, or to what extent um, do they, yeah, do they mistrust the media and then they start to trust everything else less? I think there's probably 1990s public journalism movement would suggest that yes, strong civic media does help breed trust. Yeah. I mean, but again, there's so many, sorry, I'm sounding like an academic here where I'm not giving a real answer because if we, you know, Southern Europe, Northern Europe, different, different data on, and on those questions. What, yeah. uh, can we touch a little bit on the issue of the role of journalists and journalism within this context of misinformation? Yeah. What? Sure. So I guess my sort of headline is that journalists always think that the answer to every problem in the world is more journalism, right? And they're right, of course. So after 2016, journalists all did all this chess beating and said, this is partly our fault, right? We had all these panels in America where everyone said, oh, if we'd only gone to the red states, if only we'd listened, if only we'd covered the disaffected white working class, this never would have happened. And journalists, one of the things journalists said, was, well, we need to get back out there. We need to build trust in what we do. We need to explain ourselves better. And so all of these sort of trust initiatives started. So that was one of the journalistic responses to the problem of myths and disinformation. I mean, I could go on. There were Absolutely, many more. Absolutely, a little bit more Yeah, sure. Elaboration. And then another thing journalists said, so there, uh, there began a movement really all around the world to build trust in journalism. So whether it's South Africa, whether it's India, whether it's the Midwest, there's all these attempts to get out into communities, you know, what do you want to know about? Pop up newsrooms, you know, in rural Germany. Everyone's saying, you know, what do you want to know about? Would you like to be a journalist? Do you want to come to our office? Do you want to talk to us? You know, how can we to sort of rebuild your trust in what we're doing. So that was one journalist response. Um, another journalistic response was to hire more people from these communities. So in the US, we saw initiatives like Report for America, Steve Waldman's Rebuild Local News Coalition, that if we can hear their voices and tell their stories, that will help kind of build understanding. A third um, response was fact checking. So the fact-checking movement has expanded dramatically since 2016, partly funded by Facebook that didn't want to get regulated. So they thought if we fund fact-checkers, we can avoid regulation, partly funded by foundations. Um, but it's really transformed from something that used to be done like, you know, at the New Yorker, right, a sort of insidery magazine-y thing into a broad movement. So Peter Cunliffe Jones helped start Africa Check, Laura Zomer in Buenos Aires at Chequeado, and, and I can talk more about the fact-checking movement. And then I would say another response from journalists and 
maybe I'll go into it more later, was to expose big tech, to work with whistleblowers, and to write about all the terrible things that the platforms have done. So a lot of the evidence that we have now comes from journalism. Mm -hmm. So I think those were kind of three of the big responses that journalists had to this problem. In the second round of our discussion, I would like to ask you a little bit more about the media capture on the book that you edited. But before we go to that point, I would like to go to Jerry Van Dyke and ask you, Jerry, from the point of view of someone who have been a working journalist, what are your major concerns about the direction journalism is taking right now? And what, does, what is your expectation for the future, for the next 10 years, within all this spectrum of partisanship, polarization, misinformation that we just talk about? Certainly. Um, I want to start to when I was <clears throat> much younger. And when I was in my 20s in the 1970s, I worked for Senator Henry Jackson from Washington State, where I grew up. And I worked on domestic affairs, which was timber exports and agriculture and fisheries and things like that. At the same time, another part of our office is where the neocon movement started. He was a socialist uh, when it came to politics domestically, but he was very much on the, on the right when it came to anti-Soviet affairs and in particular in the rise of, unfortunately, the tragedy of Vietnam. And what I noticed was that even at my naive age, if you will, that because, and this was just on, at the end of Watergate, and that all of a sudden journalism started to become glamorous because two very capable young men from the Washington Post succeeded in bringing down a presidency. And so all of a sudden, journalism became exciting, became interesting. I mean, it's a Hollywood movie and played by Robert Redford. And it began to change, not in a way that I understood yet, because I was too young and too naive to understand that. And I also think what started, and I've seen it really change since then, is a class struggle. It became d divisive, where journalism was no longer seen as a, as a, as a uh, profession, if you will, by the average man, but much more elitist, much more Ivy League in some ways. And what I noticed was, in, so in 1981, I no longer worked for Senator Jackson, but I was trying to work my way into journalism. I had, um, and I had an interview at the Washington Post. And I saw Ben Bradley over there, and what, what a charismatic figure. Seriously, he truly was. And I had an interview with this w woman, a, a journalist. And one of the first questions she asked me was, how do I know you're not a CIA agent? <laughs> because I work for Senator Jackson. And all of a sudden, there was a sense of condescension and arrogance that I felt coming from her to me because I worked for this man who was very much on the right. And it bothered me. And um, she still works there. I'm not going to say anything. So um, I went, uh, eventually I, I went to Afghanistan for the New York Times. And there, uh, and this is sort of a message to all of you here who may want to be journalists, um, I went with a, uh, was in Afghanistan, or was in Pakistan, about ready to go into Afghanistan. And Mike Kaufman, who was the South Asia correspondent, became my mentor, wonderful man, very much a man on the left. His father uh, was instrumental in starting the Communist Party in Poland. And he and I were standing uh, after lunch in a, on, the, in a hill, on a hill looking in west into Afghanistan. And he said, don't worry about the story it will come to you. And I felt myself relax a bit. I didn't know how nervous I was. But that story, that little, that bit of ad, you know, advice to me has carried me throughout my life. And f for a journalist to work today in what I consider a very polarized environment, he or she has to, one, not have a presupposed view of what he or she is going to see in small town America or any place like that. And what I've told journalists, especially foreign journalists, 
don't go stay in New York and cover just the United Nations. I realize you have to do that. Or in Washington and cover the White House. Go to an Indian reservation in Montana and go see loggers in Washington State. Go talk to these people on the ground because what we, I've seen and feel very strongly has evolved is this very clear perception. And when I was, I was telling both of them right before we started, one week after working in Senator Jackson's office, I said to myself, perception is reality in politics. And I knew nothing, but it was just the sense of that. So the perception is more important than anything else. So people out there, whether a logger in Washington State or someone who, works, who lives on an Indian reservation, has a certain view, not based upon any, anything else, but he or she perceives you in a certain way, it perceives a journalist in a certain way, because a lot of it has to do, I think, with Fox News, but it's become so unfortunately paralyzed because we are in the midst of what I consider a class war. And journalists are seen as up here, regardless of who you are. And it is not just here in America. Um, I was just talking about South America and Europe and so forth. And I, I told both of them just a, a real brief story that I had been working on this book and I was in the Middle East for pretty off and on for 2013 to 2019. And I had lunch one day in Bahrain with uh, an old Afghan hand, uh, Jamal Khashoggi. We'd been there together back in the 80s. And what he seized on more than anything else was class warfare in the Middle East. Now there, it's very distinct. There's no more a middle class in many ways, and they'll blame us for the destruction of the middle class. We have replaced the British in many people's eyes without considering America to have not really been a colonial power. Um, but he, he honed in on one particular time that he was in Algeria at a, at a luncheon with the Algerian leadership and a, a man who wore a very ill-fitting suit, he said, uh, took a knife to cut a piece of bread on a, a plate. Now, Algeria you know, was a French colony one time, so it was probably you know, it was a type of baguette or something, who knows? But the point was that everybody in that table, in, in, in Jamal's eyes, all of a sudden had utter disdain for this man, and they showed it in themselves. And that, that polarization that exists in the Middle East, I saw replicating itself here in, the, here in the United States. What is really bad over there is that's where the jihadist movement comes from. The jihadist, you know, every jihadi is, is a poor boy who has grew up with virtually nothing and who's been in many ways uh, indoctrinated and finds a way out through Islam, which has led to where we are in so many parts of the world, from Afghanistan to Saudi Arabia and so forth. So I think that the rise of this, of this uh, for me, the rise of the misinformation movement, the polarization is a reaction to that. And I think that people like Tucker Carlson, who I've never really watched, I've only read about him, really plays on this. And that those people out there in America who don't, uh, who don't pay too much attention to, to the news will grab onto that. And it's very hard for journalists to change. And I worked <coughs> for CBS from 2001, they hired me because of my background, after 9-11 to 2017. And I saw within CBS the growth of what they call Hispanic Journalists of America, something like that. And a lot of Hispanic, it was, had to do with a a senior vice president there who grew up in Dominican Republic, I believe, and who made an effort to bring in more minorities. And so it, it's the, the newsroom at CBS when I was there, and I'm sure it's the same today, was very diverse. But the message that came out on the news every night was not in the eyes of the public. That really hasn't changed the, where it stands in the world. It's, you know, Fox is Fox, even though CBS is very, very diverse. I think it goes out of its way to try and do a good job. But the perception is different in the, in the country. That is my big fear today. And that is what we, as journalists, have to overcome to win people over. And you said about small, small, small towns in America, boy, that's where it is so vital, so vital, more than, because that's where journalists really are close to their neighbors and what they have to say has such an impact on the, on the, uh, on the sense of what the people feel about who they're gonna vote for and 
what bond venture they're going to support or not. Uh, yeah. Respond. I th <laughs> what you're saying about the change of the class of journalists um, really strikes home for me because I'm teaching a new class every Tuesday with Sheila Cornell, the investigative reporter from the Philippines that we designed over the summer. And it's called Journalism in the Movies. And we started with the front page where there are these hard drinking, working class scoundrels. And then we also watched Good Night and Good Luck the same week where they're you know, beautifully educated, they're attractive, they're fighting McCarthy, they're thoughtful, they're philosophical, they're the fourth estate. And you could just see, I mean, Michael Schutzen, my colleague at Columbia Journalism School, has written a lot about the professionalization of journalism and the period where that happened. But it was, it was such a visual representation of the change. When I covered school boards in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, everybody I worked with was like, you know, the kid of a steel worker or the, you know, they could have been a fireman, but they became a journalist, and that's totally shifted. I guess part of what I want to ask Bob is, is it really our fault? I mean, the fact that people don't, I mean, there's been a turn away from expertise, right? After 2016, I think it was Joan Williams or Barbara Ehrenreich wrote about how in her community, you never said lawyer without saying, you know, shyster, doctor without saying quack. There's all this sociological work on you know, people hating teachers because they think they're bossy. I mean, I sort of feel like journalists are the victim of that. I'm not sure if it's our fault. Michael Shudson would say, why should anyone trust a journalist? Jur if journalists are doing their job, they shouldn't be trusted. So I'm wondering, you're the sort of polarization trust expert. What do you think? Well, no, there are a couple things going on here. And, and some, some of it goes back to the Vietnam War era the Watergate period and so forth, and it, it and part part of it has to do with uh, related to the Vietnam War and Watergate, which really soured the public toward American leadership in general. And that was a period of a, of, of a of a trackable decline in trust of leaders of all basically all it rubbed, it rubbed off on all institutions, and, all, and, inc and including the military um, military as well. And, and in a lot of ways that. That, that underlying distrust of institutions has, has kind of remained. It, it's had some ups and downs. There was there was a period of mourning in Amer mourning M O R N I N G in America with you know of Ronald Reagan. Um, th there was the period of the first Gulf War where, where where basically confidence and trust in the military soared, and it's remained pretty high compared to other other institutions. But the other thing that happened, and this goes this goes back to Nixon and uh, Nixon and Agnew, and their attitudes toward the press and their commentary about the, the elitist and snobbishness of the press. This really, no, this, this, no, this really opened, created an opening for politicians to go after the press in a more concerted way than they had previously. I mean, they, they, I mean they're, 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 politicians have always had you know, up and down relations with the press historically. But there, 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 was, a, there was an element of vehemence and hostility that resurfaced later, later on. And, 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 we, and we saw it, we, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm willing to give uh, the journalists and the press a big pass here because there's, there's been a lot of criticism. Oh. Because there's been a, because there's been a lot of crit criticism of the media and the press by political leaders. And a lot of what's happened with, regarding, with regard to partisan conflict and polarization that I talked about earlier was driven at the level of political leadership and then penetrated to the level of, of public opinion subsequently in terms of the partisan conflict that occurred, but also this hostility toward, uh, you know, toward the press has, has, has really penetrated to the level of public opinion, whereas in polls today, if you ask people about their opinions of the, of the press and the, me and the media, where, where the media and the press are called the, the mainstream, there's a partisan divide there. The Democrats are more, are more positive than, than Republicans are by, by, by a tremendous amount. I would like to go back to you, Professor Sapiro, for uh, unfolding a little bit what was the first round of our conversation regarding partisanship and polarization. We know that all political parties in the U.S. and across the globe in Western democracies are vowing for unity, for unified societies. But at the same time, divisiveness might be the in, in, in ingredient of how the political dialogue is played among the political parties. Do you think that without divisiveness, the political dialogue in the political sphere 
can have a meaning because the political parties themselves are having their political agenda upon the division regarding who is going to have more power on certain issues that you just mentioned. Okay. Well, well for, for one, as you, as, you, as you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk, which I, I, I tend to refer to as cheap talk, about the desire that political leaders express for unity and compromise and so forth. Well, it's unity and compromise on my party's terms or my, or my terms. Not, 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 a, not any kind of genuine c compromise, and 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 there were there, there have been some public opinion data that show that this feeling of of comprom the, the, the feeling of compromise is strong of genuine compromise is a, little, is a bit stronger among Democrats than than, than among Republicans. But what's preventing that is is really the the just the distance between the parties on issue after issue. I mean, Democrats and Republicans on the issue of abortion. Are, are really diametrically uh, opposed. And as new issues have, have arisen, particularly in the context of critical race, uh, take, take critical race theory and education today, I mean, the parties really are just extraordinarily divided on that. And the division is, is so large, it, 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 really, it really makes compromise, you know, very difficult. And, and, and there's, there, there's, been, uh, there's been a whole lot writ written about how is it that we can, we can imp, you know, basically make this divisiveness go away. And uh, political scientists have all kinds of solutions about restructuring uh, rules for elections to give to give moderate candidates and, and you know more of a chance of getting getting elected to public office here. But we we've basically you know reached reach the point where all of this started at the level of political leaders becoming divided on issues. And uh, what seems to be called for, and this is pie in the sky, the need for statesmen who see the need to compromise and lower the level of conflict and emotion in politics as being more important than the distances between the parties and the candidates on issues. And yeah, we discussed a little bit uh, uh, about the tools that journalists may have in order to address disinformation, misinformation. We briefly mentioned, you briefly mentioned about the fact checking. Could you elaborate a little bit more about that? Sure. So the fact-checking movement, I think, has um, transformed from what existed traditionally, which was that facts were checked before they were published. Um, and now much of it is taking place after. So that was probably the sort of phase one of fact-checking post-2016. So you had consortium of journalists all over the world, like you know, Brazil during the election time, Mexico during elections, even Ecuador, the United States, where journalists were trying to quickly, like, fact check politician speeches, for example. Um, you remember Washing Washington Post, PolitiFact, the Australian Broadcasting Agency. So journalists all over the world got in the business of checking things statements made by politicians or partnering with Facebook and then checking the facts of some of the things online. And the early literature on that was sort of mixed. It wasn't clear whether it was helping or whether it was sort of reinforcing prejudices. So there was an early paper um, by some Swedish academics that said, do not stand corrected. You know, people that didn't trust journalism would say, oh, you see, we saw a correction, therefore, they, you know, they really are unreliable. Um, so there was a lot of that, I'd say, you know, for the first few years. And then um, people like Peter Cunliffe Jones started trying to do more second generation fact checking, where they were actually going and working with government officials in parts of Africa to kind of help them um, do a better job, not, you know, not vetting necessarily their statements beforehand, but trying to assist them. Because obviously, you can't. Uh, have accurate information if you're not if there aren't sources of accurate information and this is always a problem in poor countries right when I lived in Vietnam we used to I worked for Dow Jones so we were trying to get um, statistics it was in it was inflation GDP and I don't know what some not I can't even remember the third number but the Swedish government actually had social scientists in the statistics office helping them develop the data. But what would happen is every month, you know, Dow Jones were competitive with Reuters, we needed to beat them by one second. I found out they were charging my news assistant for the data. They were selling it because it was so rare, right? So in many parts of the world, if you don't have accurate data, then there's a vacuum that gets filled. Um, so Peter Cunliffe Jones and other people started trying to work with some of the African governments. And now what Laura Zahmer is doing 
I just talked to her about this last week, is they're looking at disinformation targeted at the Latino community in the U.S. And interestingly, they're, li you know, they're literally on WhatsApp saying stuff like, if you vote for Biden, inflation will be as bad as it is in Venezuela. So what Laura and her colleagues are doing in Argentina is they've got, um, they've got a sort of you know, WhatsApp account where people can WhatsApp them if they see something they're not sure about and they can respond. Now, the problem with all of this is it's very small scale. I mean, you can't have a team of journalists sitting there all day long responding to a rumor that somebody sent them. So there obviously needs to be far more um, what I call supply side uh, uh, techniques as well to try to stop some of the stuff from circulating. But I think what's clever about what Laura and her colleagues are doing is they're trying to get it before it gets too big. So trying to sort of cut it off at the pass. But that's some of what's happening. And let's discuss a little bit about the meaning of capturing the media. You've been captured by Taliban and there are forces of trying to capture the media in terms of the influence and in terms of shaping the opinion through the uh, intermediators of uh, reporting the news to the public. How do you see this reality in nowadays, and are you concerned for... Who's trying to capture the media? Well, I would like to ask uh, Anya, because she edited also the book Media Capture, and she can give a little bit of the oh, sure. overview okay. on that, and then we go to Yeah, and pass it to you. So me, um, I've edited three volumes on the topic of media capture, which is really an idea that came out of economics. Um, George Stigler, the Nobel laureate, talked about regulatory capture, which is why don't regulatory agencies do their job? Why do they start becoming sort of too sympathetic to the people that they're supposed to be regulating? And and um, it was Alexander Dyke and Tim Besley who started looking at Andrea Pratt, who really coined the term media capture. And they were looking at countries that on paper had become democracies, like you know, Russia post-89, uh, Mexico. But they really weren't, they didn't really have a free press. And the answer was that um, gov governments and sort of and businesses were basically in cahoots to control the media. I'm sure, Thanos, you're interested because Greece is considered a perfect example. Yeah, and example. actually I had emailed you when I read the book. Yeah, exactly. So when I, so when I started editing, when I started publishing about this, um, a lot of journalists were sort of like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, or this is very old fashioned, or how is this different from before, or it's not really a problem in the US. But now when you go to conferences, everybody talks about media capture all the time because it's so prevalent. And I think in Europe, probably Hungary and Poland would be the best examples. Historically in Latin America, you've had you know, many media outlets that were corporate controlled or in, you know, sort of in, in bed with the government. And I I think in the U.S. the perfect example would be, you know, Fox under Murdo under Trump, right, where they were really, really supporting his agenda until mm -hmm. they kind of split with him. Yeah, and that must be true of a lot of the Middle East. I assume a lot of the media must be very captured there. Well, yeah, it's owned by <laughs> Saudi Arabia. There's no such thing yeah. as a free press in most of the, in most of the Middle East, without a doubt. Um, when we talk about capturing the media, it's really good point. It's the first time I've heard it. I don't where, where have I been? Um, the thing I think about, I'll tell a story real quickly. I was in, I was in, um, in the Amazon on a National Geographic project, and we were working our way up this river. We stopped one night at a, um, at a, a mission, and I asked the priests, all priests in South America from, are from Europe. It's interesting. None from, uh, none from South America, and I didn't find any from North America. Um, and I asked him, what's the name of the tribe? And he said, oh, it's this tribe. And then he turned to me and said, well, you belong to a tribe too, the tribe of journalists. <laughs> and I felt a feeling of comfort. Mm -hmm. It was just, oh, I belong to something. I'm part of something. It's very small, but it meant something to me. Now, I was in, uh, as I mentioned, I was in Afghanistan in the 80s, and so uh, I was not there in the 90s when the Taliban rose, but I began to listen to what people in America were saying, particularly Hillary Clinton and, um, uh, so Secretary of State who just died. Um, Colin Powell? No. Albright. Madeleine Albright. And they were going on at great length about women and how women were being treated so badly. And I go, wait a minute, it's not always that way there. I know how it works. Yes, I've seen 
Uh, I saw a man once carrying a, a teapot and his wife carrying a mattress on her head. But another time I saw a very masculine, muscular, tall, handsome uh, member of the Mujahideen sitting around a campfire at night hugging his little daughter wonderfully. It was a beautiful little image I still have of that. And I've seen, and most Afghans I've talked to, when I talk to the men, they'll say, well, I have seven sons and three daughters, but I like my daughters better than my sons. Mm -hmm. So it's not always that way. And so 9-11 happened. So next, uh, with December 24th, I went back to Afghanistan for CBS. And I walked through Kabul, which to me looked like pictures I had seen of Berlin after the war, or at the end of the war in some, some parts, not all. And I went to the Office of Care, the oldest and largest NGO in America. And the wo there's a woman who was a director. We talked about Afghanistan. We came to the subject of girls' education. And she said to me, more girls went to school under the time of the Taliban than ever before. I went, what? That's not what I've heard, and that all the, the image I now have is that the Taliban were horrible to women. Now, I understand the Mujahideen and the Taliban were the same in some ways. They're poor boys. They don't have money. They burn girls' schools because they're destroying what they want but cannot have. And I don't accept it. It's horrible. But that exists among these, these poor boys. And so I went back to, in that time, um, CBS and, and ABC had a house together. And a lot. this was the center of where journalists would come. NBC had its own house, but people from newspapers said, would come there. So I, I, I said something. No one paid any attention to me. So I said, I have to look further into this. So I went to uh, a man named Anders Fang, F-A-N-G-E, who was head of, still belongs to the venerable Swedish committee, which does wonderful, wonderful work throughout the world. And he was in Afghanistan throughout the entire Taliban period. I said, Anders, uh, I forget her name, uh, Kara said X, Y, Z. And he said, absolutely. I have all the data. The more girls went to school under the Taliban than in any time in history. Here's all the, we can provide all the data to you. This is Sweden. I was never to, able to get anybody interested in this. And I blame myself for not doing, and I've talked about this a little bit with Thanos uh, in another talk, is that, and I'm addressing journalists here and talking a little bit as, as a journalist, not so much as an academic, but there's a much wider uh, an intellectual view, and that is that um, freedom of the press, critical, of course, it goes without saying, comes from within. You have to get away from being part of a tribe. You have to be able to think that I have to go outside the tribe if I believe that, that story is true. And you're going to risk being alone. But sometimes that's where the truth lies. And it's not easy. Um, and people do it. And you can have tremendous, you can have tremendous effect. Uh, Seymour Hirsch is now, because of what he has said about Nord Stream, is gathering tremendous force in, in Europe and elsewhere. So it can be done. So, um, and I'm not in any way trying to criticize journalism, because that's my field. Um, but it's, it's the tendency to be a part of something and to want to be a part and to accept it sort of curbs your ability to, to act freely. And therefore, you are subject to all kinds of corporate capture, cap, you know, to be captive by a cognitive capture. Well, and uh, it's if you um, work for a major news organization, you have to be careful because you can't really go outside what they may want to project. It's certainly not false what they're trying to project. Absolutely not. I don't. I've never seen anything like that. But. Right now, because we are such a polarized nation, the ways out of this, I've been thinking of this, how can I, what can I say today about how to, how to deal with misinformation, which comes from Fox in great, in great quantities, um, and polarization is the ability to you know, step aside because, oh, CBS, that's ever since uh, Walter, Crank, Walter Cronkite, you're, you're too liberal. Um, that perception there, how do you get out of that? How do you, how do you reach somebody in Montana? It's to be able to, in some cases, you may have to go alone. I don't know if you can answer this, but I was wondering, was it absolute numbers of girls going to school or percentage of the population? Oh. I mean, when they said more kids were going to school, were there just more kids? Yeah, and also what ages? Because I thought part of the problem was the higher, girls not being allowed to go to higher education. Yeah, we were not, 
I, very good question. I really can't answer that 100% correctly, but this is something I'm not finished with in my own mind, and mm. I'm going back to deal with this, and I'll, actually I'll tell you why and how I'm going to do this very soon. But um, education in Afghanistan was such for so long that, by the way, there was no such thing as a madrasa. Uh, madrasas were banned in Afghanistan in 1923. Uh, a wonderfully progressive uh, king, Amun, Amunullah, uh, banned, and he tried to ban the veil, but the tri tribes, very conservative tribes, uh, revolted. The British <laughs> were not on his side either, and so it failed. But from 1923 through 1973, there were no, there were no um, madrasas in Afghanistan, or maybe one or two. Uh, I'm I am close to, because of my background, I'm close to some of our enemies today, particularly the Akhanis, the Akhani Network. I lived with them in the 1980s. I'm in contact with them. I've got a lot of dealings with them. And they told me very specifically, and Jaladin Akhani, you know, his son, Surajuddin, is the military commander of the Taliban, that, and by the way, is very, very progressive in this. If you saw um, uh, Christian Amanpour's interview with him six months, seven, eight months ago, to her great credit, she made a point of saying, I noticed when I was at the Interior Ministry, he's Minister of Interior now, which controls the police and the intelligence agencies, um, that I noticed when I was at your office, the Ministry of Interior, all the women who were working in the office. He is seen as the most pragmatic of all those in, in Afghanistan today as regards, as regards to, to women. And, um, just, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this now. I didn't, certainly didn't intend to. This is just, this is personal, it's an aside. But I was on, for this book, I was on Christiana Amanpour just oh, about a month ago. And she uh, dealt with my time with the Connies in the past. And, at the, and a little bit, uh, you know, my experiences as a prisoner. And, and after that program aired, Sirajadi Nakani and his younger brother, Anas, who's seen as the future of the Akhani Network. And in my view, the Akhani Network is the most lethal jihadist organization in the world. One, the Al-Qaeda you know, under bin Laden is pretty much emasculated now. Also, they're backed by the Pakistani army. That's it. Uh, nothing happens with the Taliban without, particularly with the Akhani Network, without Pakistan's being behind them. So, Sarajdeen so Akhani and his younger brother saw the program and invited me back. So I'm going over there in a few weeks. And one of the principal things I'm going to talk about, because I've talked to his best friend, we go through mediators because they don't dare make phone calls because everybody would be listening to them. Far more sophisticated in phones. That one phone I get from his comes from Belgium. <laughs> They're good at these things. Uh, these are not provincial people. Um, and is to talk precisely with them about how to deal with this problem of girls' education because they support it. There's one man, the, the emir of Afghanistan, like he who runs Iran, <coughs> has all the power and is diametrically opposed. He's a village mullah who feels that once a girl reaches puberty, she goes into that village and you never see her again. And that's why, that's why it's that way. So I'm, I'm not the moderator, but I have two questions, one of which I'm sure everyone wants to know. I haven't read your book. I will after this. How could you... You seem to love Afghanistan and know all about Afghanistan. After what happened to you, could you possibly explain? <laughs> I bet everyone in this room is wondering. <laughs> and the second thing is you said earlier um, something about how all the jihadis are you know, poor people with no opportunity. To what extent is, it, is the situation like in the U.S. where Tucker Carlson knew perfectly well that the election fraud was totally not true. He said it to get, you know, completely cynically, said it to get ratings. Now we, all, now we know because the coverage of Dominion. To what extent are the are there sort of wealthy Saudis or whoever who are kind of playing, you know, pandering to the masses like populists everywhere in the world? Anyway, that's too long question. I'm so sorry. I'm not the moderator, but <laughs> I want to know. Okay, I'll deal with that one first. Uh, well, I, on this project, I lived in Yemen for four months. I went to learn Arabic. I went to a Muslim Brotherhood school. Um, and there I learned that what we called at that time, it's since gone by the wayside pretty much as a result of Ukraine, um, is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is a term coined by America. 
all Al Qaeda groups in Yemen are controlled by leaders. Each one, there is a Ali, Abdul, Ali Abdullah Saleh was the leader of, of Pakistan. Excuse me, of Yemen for a long time. There is the uh, the Al Qaeda of Ali Abdullah Saleh. There's the there's the the Al Qaeda of this person and this person and that person. These are private militias that they use for their own purposes, and it's also, and this goes across the Middle East, and this is so tragic, and this really hurts, but it is a way to extract money from America. We have Al Qaeda. I need Al Qaeda. I mean, I need money to put up to fight Al Qaeda. It is a, it is a way to, it is a revenue genera generating business. And if you listen to Yemenis, they will tell you that Prince, uh, who was once the, uh, I want to say Sadar, but it's not that, very popular in, um, in Washington with his home. And then he had a place in Aspen, um, very prominent, very fun-loving. There's a photograph of him sitting on his sofa looking down on President Bush at his ranch. Um, he is, resp yes, is responsible for today the backing of Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was in, when I was in, um, Saudi Arabia, which would be two months in 2014. I said, ISIS, what is ISIS? And the man said, it's going to burn. I remember talking to, and I was, I was, at, a, I was at a think tank there. Um, and so I was with men who were, no women, uh, very much attuned to uh, things like this and international events. I said, ISIS, what's going to happen with ISIS? It's going to burn. It's going to burn across the Middle East but not here. Uh, al-Baghdadi, the, the leader of, of Al-Qaeda, uh, excuse me, of ISIS, his wife is Saudi. So what I'm saying is, precisely that. It's a way for print, and, it's a, and this, does, this does not come from me. This comes from people I talk to. It is a way for wealthy princes, whether in Qatar, whether in Saudi Arabia, or in, in the UAE, to wage jihad without having to do it yourself. You support these young men to do this. Another thing that I found truly interesting there to show the polarization of those countries is that I, I remember talking one night at, at length, and I asked um, an American, two American friends, I need to talk to a family. Give me a family I can talk to that will be open with me and I will not, I will certainly not harm them. And I, I have protected them entirely. And I talked to the father at length and, he sa and, I t and then I talked to a, a, a professor later and he amplified this. And that is, he said, young boys, here, join ISIS, what you call ISIS. Uh, they join all these jihadi groups. They go to Syria not to fight you, because they are so angry that their fathers have been so emasculated under this dictatorship that they cannot do anything. The king and the royal family win and they control everything. Now, it takes a psychologist that I am not to, to truly grasp that, but you understand what I'm saying is that, it, that those boys who go there are not fighting us. They're fighting, in a way, for their fathers. Bec or they're angry that their fathers have been so emasculated, able. And he said, and I remember his son that night drove me back in a, I don't know what it was, a Maserati or something like this. Uh, seriously, uh, this very expensive new European racing machine back to my hotel. And he talked about the girl he loved but could never marry because she belonged to the wrong tribe. And so if he belonged to that tribe, if he married her, <laughs> then something would happen to him and his family. So these ancient rivalries, these ancient problems have caused so much. But it's these ruling families, whether it's the UAE, whether it's Doha, these are all dictatorships. And I feel the conspiracy theories come from not having any power. I noticed in Egypt, they blame me for uh, the fact that the tourists didn't come, or Obama particularly because the, t uh, the tourists didn't come because we got rid of, of uh, this, this leader or that leader. It's when you don't have power, conspiracy theories develop, in my experience, over the years. And I think I've talked enough about this sort of thing. Sorry, my, my other question. 
Oh, I was hoping I could get away with it. Um, no, no, I, I'll deal with it. I, I get it. So. We would like to share some questions from the audience here. You and Bryce. Let's start with you first. fear of globalism or this political word globalism and then I say that because when you actually chat with people they're so curious about the world that they're curious about every culture that isn't the United States but then the political conversation is always so like this is everywhere else is miserable except here but how do you negotiate this uh, com this this like it's bipolar or something this relationship with world and wanting to be at the center of it but not wanting to because it can be a bit othering right it's like you don't get the same quality of answer if you're not coming from the United States or uh, there's like this foreignness that is like uh, I guess my question is how you've been in a setting that you were totally the foreigner right uh, in Afghanistan what how did you negotiate that like stop being the foreigner and become a little bit more comfortable with the community oh uh, if you recall, six months, a year ago, George Shultz, former Secretary of State, wrote a very, very good farewell article in the Washington Post. And he said, the coin of the realm is trust. And his experience as a diplomat, whether it was in the Soviet Union or everywhere, it was trust. I've been in places where I've had to go through two tight, th it was in South America, through two translators, went from English to, to Spanish to Quechua to this person. And the only thing that really works is you look at one another in the eye. Do I trust this person? Does he trust me? Mm -hmm. If it comes down to trust. And that all people everywhere are the same. Now, insofar as being in that prison with the Taliban, mm -hmm. um, no, there was no trust whatsoever. It was reptilian. Um, I was with, I had two bodyguards who betrayed me. I had a fixer who betrayed me, and they did for money. And we each had sort of a cot, uh, and you had your territory, and you didn't cross that territory. It became that, that um, reptilian, that primal. But ultimately, ultimately, um, it came down to Well, I, my rent, my, it was $1.5 million and three men from Guantanamo. Um, but also, um, about a week after I was there, there was a drone overhead. And my fixer said, can you see inside us? And he can you see in here? And I said, no. I really wasn't sure, but uh, I said, no. And all of a sudden, I had power. That's America up there. And by the way, I, I have to tell you this just to say, just two weeks ago, a, a woman I know, a lawyer, whom I have not seen in 20 years, sent me an email. And she said, I was at a cybersecurity um, event in Washington. And a woman at the NSA, her first name is Clara, no, Rita, Rita, NSA, so proudly held up your book called Captive and that she was able to find you. So. A journal, how this here, the wonderfulness of what America can do there. This one woman, with her whatever ability she had at the NSA, was able to track phone calls that my, my Taliban captives were making to pinpoint where I was and, w and put, that, put that drone overhead, which changed the atmosphere in there, that I was not alone. The United States was there, and the United States in all its power. It's extraordinary. Um, I also had one other form of ammunition, if you will, was that um, I, I was older, you know, my hair is gray, and um, they saw that, of course, immediately. And I, I said, I was here during jihad. They used the, they used the word jihad for the Afghan-Soviet war. They haven't, they never, I've never heard it for our war, the war, the U.S. NATO war. I don't, I don't know why. But um, I was with the Akhanis. I lived with Jalal al-Din. 
I must have said that a hundred times. And I was, in a way, um, even though mock executions and things were, it was hard, very, very hard, but um, they, I'm here today, they let me go, they let me go. I mean, there were various reasons for letting me go, but it was that, it was, um, it started, it started with the um, thing. Uh, in all fairness, and I certainly didn't want this conversation to be like that to answer your question, is that um, um, a long, long time ago, uh, I was, I, after the Army, I, on the GI Bill, I went to school in Paris, and I, um, w when I finished, I was, um, I remember sitting at a t cafe in, in, in Paris with a group of st fellow students, all of whom were foreigners, who had gone to the uh, Institute of Political Studies. And each person, young man, went around the table, as many of you do, have, will. Uh, what are you going to do next? What do you want to be in life? We all went around. Oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to work for South Peace. One guy said, I want to go to Afghanistan. There was this sense of adventure in me that I'd seen a poster that wanted to do that. I called my my parents in Washington State, and I asked of my younger brother, who had just finished high school, if he could come over and join me. And to this day, we don't know how, why our mother said yes. And at that time, this is during the, this is the 70s now, it was, there was such a thing called, it was before the black curtain of radical Islam descended upon Asia. And it was, there was something called, maybe Bob will know this, uh, the hippie trail that went from uh, essentially from Istanbul to to uh, Nepal or you know, Kathmandu or the beaches of of, um, of of southern India, and so you could buy an old car in Europe. In my case was an old Volkswagen. You can drive it across to Asia and you could sell it for a profit and come back. So my brother and I drove across to Asia. We ran out of money in Afghanistan. And at that time, it was this golden age when women dressed like women in New York and Paris. And uh, only a few were veiled, where you could hear the Rolling Stones mixed with this evening call to prayer. <laughs> I'm serious. There were 5,000 to 6,000 hippies, according to um, uh, records or sociologists who follow this, um, at that time in a city of 25, uh, 2000, uh, a uh, quarter of a million with hippies who brought the Afghans into the international drug trafficking market, by the way. So it was, at that time, long camel caravans came through the streets and silent in the afternoon sun. It was romantic. It was wonderful. At that same time, the, the, uh, the prime minister of Afghanistan overthrew his brother-in-law and first cousin, the king of Afghanistan, and set in motion directly set in motion the rise of the Mujahideen and the U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia and a way for us to transfer our disaster in, in Vietnam to consider the crusade against communism and choose Afghanistan and the Mujahideen as our pro proxy army. So I had this wonderful feeling of Afghanistan when, when I was a boy, when I was so young, and I held on to that, and because I, I was kidnapped, there are, there are people who are missing there today, there are hostages. Uh, this, is a, this is in memory of Stephen Sotloff, who, if you recall, was beheaded by ISIS, who wrote to his parents before he was beheaded and he kept his head up. It's a very, very hard thing to do when they have a knife at your throat, I know or at your back, I know what that's like. Very, very hard, very courageous man. He said everyone has two lives, that's what it says right here, it's a two lives foundation. You only reali you realize you <clears throat> everyone has two lives. You realize you have, and then oh, how does it go? You, everyone has two lives, and you realize when you realize you only have one <laughs> is in effect when your life begins. Mm -hmm. So I have an obligation to, because I survived, to find those people who are still missing. Americans who are still missing, and I use my contacts with the Akhani's to do that. And I'm also dealing with this girls, um, with the girl, with the problem, with the, 
the, clearly the problem of girls. Because I, I'm older and I have this, this trust built up with the Akhanis, I'm still very much a part of that world. Thank you. Bryce. After hearing your story, it's, it's hard to say anything. Exactly. <clears throat> but, I mean, first of all, we, we, we all recognize that, that, that tribalism is, is a very strong concept. And, and we are not exempt, uh, as evidenced by the, the uh, meeting the other night the, the, in the rally in Waco, Texas. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. that's enough, enough said. So I have a comment and a question. Uh, the, the comment is that since most of the people here are based here, I just want to, and I, I live here, uh, I just want to comment on the importance of your, of, of reaching out into, into small towns uh, uh, and the value of that, of small towns in America. I want to tell everybody here that m many of you may live in Manhattan, but New York City itself is a community of small towns. There are more than, you know, in, in 1898, more than 100 towns and villages were incorporated into the city of New York. But, but there are many small town stories in Queens and in Brooklyn and in the Bronx and, and small communities that you may not even know about, but if you look, in, look, look into them, they're there, and they're, 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 and the people there are different from the people here. They're, 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 uh, they're, they're, they have a more local, more provincial uh, concept of life than you'll find here. So if, if you need different opinions, go there. Don't just speak to people here. And, and so my question is, then is, and it's probably too late in the day to bring this up, but we have not touched on the, the problems that artificial intelligence, we've talked about misinformation, disinformation, stories and lies and making it up, and all the people who can do that, and that, but now we're faced with a new, a, a, a new adversary, artificial intelligence, which, which may, fool all of us, may, may be able to take everything we've ever thought was true and reorganize it so that it, be, it will become harder and harder to understand where, where the truth and the facts, the truth is and the facts are. So. Robert uh, Nightingale. Okay, well briefly, because I know there's a lot of questions. I think you're absolutely right that in the world of mis and disinformation, there's um, great worry about generative AI. We, Bob and I were just on a panel a couple days ago with a colleague who has a company that does image verification, and he was extremely gloomy. Um, and I think in general, the mis disinfo people do feel like it's just gotten worse. It's spread all over. Um, regulation, you know, even though the European Union has passed a whole set of terrific regulations, they're going to be hard to enforce against these large tech companies. But at the same time, there's also um, a bit of a backlash where a lot of, especially in the U.S., more than overseas, people are kind of throwing up their hands and saying, it's here to stay. There's not much we can do about it. Why are you even talking about this? Um, and even it's sort of in academia, even just in the last few weeks, there's been some papers saying kind of get over it. Um, so I think, I think maybe that's a human response to something that's so big that there's a significant number of people that are kind of giving up now. What well, we, we also talked about at the conference was the need to educate the, the public, the people about you know, de dealing with the new technology, dealing with, dealing with misinformation and things of that sort. And that's, that, that's I think, the next challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Nancy? Yeah. I wanted to build on that. Recently, I was talking to Brad Smith from Microsoft, and he was saying just what you had said, that there's misinformation, disinformation, but there's something called malinformation. Yes. Mm. And malinformation is the intent, as you just spoke of, to manipulate, control, or in 
some way deceptively uh, construct a reality. Uh, so I was going to ask you, as you just did, uh, where you felt this was going to be manageable, how this was going to be manageable. And then just want to add something to share. And as I worked with Laura Bush for many girls who were first able to go to school and we collected money and fabric to make uniforms for them mm -hmm. because you know, it was so sudden she led a very good initiative. Yeah. So would you like to follow up something on the question? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Um, I'm a guest. Yes, please. Right? Your question. I'm a guest. Um, and I, the young gentleman over there raised the question of globalization. I am, I suppose, the child of globalization, so I span quite a lot of that. I think one, um, thank you very much for, there's so many aspects. I think we could stay here for another two days. Um, uh, there, I think what, uh, what really struck me um, are two things. One, we didn't talk about, we talked about class divide, and we talked about all the divisions in the US at this point, we're not raising the question of education. Because if you look at the levels of education, I'll never forget my first encounter with a class from Staten Island of 70 or 80 year old and up getting a letter afterwards from their teacher who didn't know how to spell. Now, then going back to the journalist issue, I mean, at the end of the day, journalism is the reflection of a society. We, you know, we don't live in, in a vacuum. And, um, and there is one issue that um, is, a, if you look at, at the press, let's say the press, and if you look at the media, there's a question of integrity that isn't raised. What is the integrity of um, reporting? That goes beyond the fact-checking. We're now in the fact-checking business because we are so fast. But integrity is important. Uh, I think what happened and what we are not looking at, you know, we're talking about misinformation, malinformation, you can call it what you want. We're talking about I want a, a, a social chaotic uh, a chaos which exists. Um, and we have it at the, you know, if you just read a lot of history, you will see that Jacques Attali in France was talking about it and so on, about what happened at the end of the 19th century, the same thing, conspiracy theories, the, the chaos that existed, uh, of course we didn't have the media as we have today and so on and so forth. We are in changing times. And, and so, uh, in a certain sense, it's understandable. Uh, so I, you know, somehow that divide that exists in, now I'm talking this society, is very much driven by, uh, 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 and I would also say an ideological bias in education. You were talking about girls. I remember when um, uh, we went to, into Iraq, we were, I uh, was by some chance working on the Constitution. And we were all talking about women. What will be the new Constitution? What will be the new laws on, on women, etc.? But nobody actually, uh, you know, went and looked what happened with women in Iraq prior to when we went into Iraq. And, and uh, by chance I knew. But uh, so there is also an ideological bias. Uh, that is ingrained in the education that actually does uh, blur the, uh, grow, the, 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 the picture and that at, at the same time influences the journalism, the way we report from, area, from countries and so on that are there, including that question of girls and education. So to follow up, uh, any comment that you would like to make? Well, I, I don't know if more people want to ask questions, but I would just yeah. add to your mistress and Mal, we haven't at all talked about business models and the fact that a significant number of people that are putting false information online are actually making a lot of money, you know, like the, the Alex Joneses of this world. But I think there must be, a, there's a lot of people yeah, that want I to think talk, we, so we, we have one more or two questions, so who would like to follow up? Mark? Mark. Thank you, and thank you all, this has been great. Um, 
kind of a 30,000 foot question or maybe even 50,000 foot, but we've talked in amongst this some of the periods when it seemed like after enormous uh, misinformation and divisions in society, things started to get together again. And some of that may be the 50s where it's wealth, some of that may be the 20s where it's after absolute apocalypse or war, um, some of it may be reconstruction after again the Civil War, but any, you know, PhD thesis on this, I'm sure, but any thoughts on what's it's going to take, assuming human na nature is not to destroy itself, to kind of try to move the other way and come back together a bit on this? Well, uh, well I'm, I'm not pretty, I'm not optimistic about this because the, 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 the divisions here really are deep. They're ingrained in the party, the parties, they're ingrained across um, a wide range, range of issues. They're, they're, in, they're embedded in social divisions in society, society as well. Um, the, the, we, we, we survived the post-Civil War fissure by basically suppressing the issue of race in the United States. Um, we, ha we have so many conflictual issues in, in the United States at the moment. It, it's, well, it's impossible to suppress them, and even if there were any effort to, there are the, you know, the, this is where the where, this is where the press comes in to the extent that the conflict exists. The press will cover that conflict and magnify the conflict. Um, so I decided basically your point of view a few years ago, which is I teach, therefore I cannot be depressing. So my class is called Solutions, Policy Solutions to Online Mis- and Disinformation. And it's my most, I'm sick to death of the subject. My students, it's my most popular class. And I go through 10 solutions and I start with the demand side. Uh, fact-checking, media literacy, building trust, and then I go to the supply side. So I look at everything from um, the European regulations, uh, you know, Digital Service Act, Digital Markets Act, and defamation suits to suppress it. But the, the thing that's happening in the U.S. and actually all over the world are efforts to support journalism. Um, and those range from everything, like in Australia, getting Google and Facebook to pay for news, which they really hated doing, and that's part of why they're now talking about pulling out, to efforts by people like Sarah Beth Berman and Steve Wallman in the U.S. to raise foundation funding to support local news and outlets owned by people of color. So I would say what's happening in the U.S. is we can't get our act together to do major regulation, so we're seeing a lot of local efforts. New York City, Mayor de Blasio in 2019, signed an executive order to give city adverts to outlets owned by um, minority and immigrant communities. So a lot of small scale, scale stuff like that is happening around the country. I don't, I agree with Bob, I'm not sure if it's going to be enough, but at least people are trying and that's something. I think we should continue the conversation off stage. Right. And thank you so much for your presence, your participation, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. So, so much. That's always. We are truly honored.